So um, to keep us on time, uh, we'll go ahead and, and start. Um, just as a reminder, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box. We will have time and, and space for questions from the audience. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box and put any questions that you have there. So today we're going to be addressing LMIC student and trainee experiences pursuing a global health career. So we're going to address barriers, challenges, and potential solutions. This session is presented by the CUGH Trainee Advisory Committee, known as TAC and the Afro Health student community. Oops, apologies. All right, so today um, to moderate, we have uh, an excellent team. We have Ashley Swing, um, who is a TAC member and a doctoral student in the joint doctoral program at San Diego State University and University of California, San Diego. And then myself, Elizabeth Frost, um, I am chair of CUGH, the CUGH TAC. Uh, I am in the same program as Ashley, the, the joint doctoral program. Um, and then we have Dr. Prajush Kumar, who is also a member of TAC. And he is a medical intern at, at uh, Dr. Baboa Sahib Medical College in India. So a little bit about this, this first part that we're going to be going over. So in November of last year, a group of us students and trainees from TAC and AfroHealth put together a short questionnaire. The goal of the questionnaire was to gather information from students and trainees about their experiences getting into global health, finding global health training opportunities, and establishing themselves in a global health career. The questionnaire was administered via social media, and it was sent out to all of our networks. We are presenting the findings here today as a way to introduce the topic, but also as a way to push us into further discussion about the barriers that LMIC students face and the challenges, um, and, and hopefully this will challenge us to think about the solutions or strategies needed to change things for the better in the future. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, like Elizabeth said, my name is Ashley Swing, and um, it's great to see everybody on the call. And I'll go ahead and jump into um, presenting some of these findings. So we had a total of 44 survey participants uh, coming from countries all across the globe, um, as you can see here in this figure. Um, so the vast majority of our participants um, came from an African country, um, with about a third of the participants being from Nigeria, 12% uh, being from Uganda, the US, Somalia, um, and then many other participants from other African countries, as well as um, Brazil and India and China. Next slide, please. Um, so the majority of our survey participants were students or trainees in a global health program. We did have a few administrators and faculties in these programs, but there were also several other um, participants that, um, that identified as a kind of a different um, a, in a different uh, field. So, for example, we had um, research assistant, uh, faculty in other departments. We also had um, medical and public health specialists, as well as prospective students. Um, so we also wanted to know what skills um, people believed students and trainees from LMICs needed to be successful in a global health career. So we really consolidated a lot of um, the responses and um, made this, this uh, word cloud, as you can see here. Um, so at the size of the text indicates um, skills that were commonly mentioned. And so as you can see, research was the dominant one that was um, mentioned the most amongst our survey participants, but also writing, leadership, and creativity um, were highly valued skills. 
Um, but there are many other skills, as you can see, that were also mentioned, um, many of which are um, maybe a little bit more professional oriented, such as networking or um, data analysis, visualization, statistics. Uh, but then there are a lot of uh, more interpersonal skills, um, such as uh, resourcefulness and resilience. Um, so when it comes to challenges that LMIC students and trainees um, reported having um, with getting into global health programs, um, the majority of our survey participants mentioned um, the issue of having high financial costs of attending. Um, so these, um, these responses, by the way, are, are a check all that apply. So um, there are uh, many of our survey participants um, mentioned several different issues. So um, in in addition to financial cost being an issue, there's also lack of mentorship and support, as well as um, visa issues and immigration issues. Um, and then in regards to language that um, our survey participants uh, felt that global health curriculums should be offered, um, interestingly, a majority of our uh, survey participants um, said that they, they prefer English, but um, as you can see, there are several other participants that suggested other languages as well, um, including Spanish, French, and then others such as uh, Portuguese. Um, and then we also asked about the type of work, uh, global health work, that people were interested in. Um, so the majority of our um, survey participants uh, stated that they were interested in international global health work, um, but we, as you can see, there's a, a variety of interests that were expressed, um, also including um, just general research as well as um, more implementation science. Um, and the majority of our, um, our survey participants uh, seem to um, have concerns about accessibility to global health conferences. So 37% uh, felt that it would, global health conferences are not accessible at all. 53% um, felt like they were somewhat accessible, but only a very small portion, 9% felt that they were very accessible. And then similarly, we asked about um, the likelihood that students and trainees from LMICs could get exchange opportunities. Um, and we kind of saw a very similar uh, trend. So 27% of our um, participants stated they felt that those opportunities were not likely at all. 54% um, said that they were maybe somewhat likely, but only 17% um, and 2% felt like they were likely or very likely. And so in this vein, we also wanted to better understand um, the issues that might be associated with, with these um, opportunities, including visa struggles. Um, so um, about three fourths of our survey participants did not have any issues with getting visas, but about a fourth did. Um, so the countries that were most challenging for students to get visas to go to included North American countries such as US and Canada, as well as um, Europe as, as a whole as in some specific European countries. Um, and then the survey participants that um, reported having it, these visa issues, um, as you can see, um, the majority of them stated they did not receive any help um, from their country with getting, um, with getting their visa. But uh, a few of them did say that they were able to get help from uh, school or work for um, their, their applying for their visa. But still, there were um, several that felt that they were on their own for um, being able to apply for their visa. So for this next section, we had a couple questions that were open-ended. And we asked students, what are the challenges that um, students from LMICs have when they go and they, they seek out global health jobs? Um, and as you can see here, the majority of people or quite a few people uh, mentioned lack of financial support, lack of awareness about global health jobs, global health opportunities. There was also language barriers. Um, people mentioned lack of experience, visa, again, visa permit issues. Um, so there's quite a few issues that people mentioned. Um, in addition, we have two quotes here that we think really um, capture some of the issues going on. 
one participant said it's due to lack of resources rather than lack of knowledge and expertise. And that's why LMIC students quickly rise to equal levels when given the opportunity. Another participant said international students at Yale are not allowed to seek off campus jobs in a term or doing that during the semester. Uh, but Yale does not give administrative support. Dozens of international students tried and failed. And so this captures some of the issues for um, students who come over to the US to do global health programs is they're not allowed to work or not able to work. We also asked about challenges specifically for women. Um, and as you can see here, some of the things mentioned were gender discrimination family responsibilities, lack of education, traveling, um, and as well, there's issues of sexual harassment, financial burden, um, quite a few different issues that people mention. Uh, in terms of what participants said uh, about challenges for women, uh, one participant said, we live in a world where women are still overlooked for certain jobs. Another participant said, the challenge is that educational opportunities are low due to early marriage in Africa, and then she delivers more children and is refused to continue education. Another person said security and safety are issues, especially in locations where women's rights have been stifled. And then we asked um, the, the flip side of it, what are challenges for men? And as you can see here, um, some of it's a little bit similar, financial um, uh, finances, pressure to provide is, is unique and different um, when asking about challenges for men. Uh, family responsibilities, access to resources, work experiences. Uh, the responses that we got for this question were men are leaving their family behind focusing on money making, or sorry, focusing on making money as opposed to career development, problems with visa and immigration. Um, there is now a lot of focus on encouraging women to take up careers, and I believe this is very good. However, I think this has also resulted in highly qualified males being rejected because of the need for gender balance and recruitment. So these are some of the sentiments that came out um, when we ask questions about male barriers. So when asked about solutions to these challenges, um, to getting into global health programs um, and finding global health training opportunities, participants mentioned um, the need for scholarships, the need for technical support, mentorship and coaching. Um, those were the, the big ones. Um, and participants said to, as a solution, make regular contacts with the applicants to reassure and encourage them and also make certain that they are doing things right. So having the university programs or the training programs um, really give more support, give more encouragement, um, reach out and help students from LMICs get into these, these programs and these training opportunities. Another participant said mentorship requires early integration and partnering of students or trainees with global health champions. The earlier, the better. So again, this is mentioning the need for mentorship, the need for coaching. Um, the third person, again, mentions um, something similar in terms of mentorship. I find it very hard to gain opportunity or mentorship within the field. I am often dismissed and told opportunities are out there without given proper direction. So there's quite a bit of focus on mentorship. And lastly, we asked about what support students and trainees from LMICs um, need in finding a global health job. So participants said, we need encouragement. We need to expand the opportunities in, uh, of global health to, um, I believe that's supposed to be the global south. Um, another person said, ease the process with special consideration, lift up young adults, make job, op job opportunities known and allow for fair competition and allow room for collaboration and foreign study programs. So 
So uh, I wanted to take a quick moment to thank all the TAC and APRA Health members who contributed and helped and really made the survey and this entire satellite session a success. Um, so we have here all the all the names of TAC and Afro Health members who have contributed and and uh, very integral for for this to happen. All right, and now we're going to transition to our panel speakers. Thank you so much, Ashley and Elizabeth, for moderating the wonderful presentation. Now, for all the global health enthusiasts, we are now moving forward with an interesting panel discussion with esteemed speakers on the topic of LMIC student and trainee experiences pursuing a global health career, addressing the barriers, challenges, and potential solutions. We want this discussion to be an opportunity for all the interested students, trainees, and others to interact with the esteemed guest panelist. Please feel free to write in the chat box for any question you may have during the panel. In commencing proceedings, I first extend my heartfelt gratitude to all our participants for being present here today. In the facilitation of today's panel discussion, we are fortunate to be graced with the presence of eight esteemed professionals of the field. I will begin today's proceedings with a brief introduction of our speakers. Okay, right, so first we have Dr. Quinton Achbaum. Dr. Quinton Achbaum was born and raised in Namibia and South Africa. He initially studied law at the University of Cape Town and then completed his MD, MPH, PhD, and postdoctoral studies at Harvard Medical School and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, followed by residency and fellowship training in Massachusetts General Hospital. He is currently Professor of Pathology, Microbiology, and Immunology, and Director of the Transfusion Medicine Fellowship Program at Vander Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. He serves on numerous national and international clinical global health, education, and health humanities committees and boards. He serves on the board of the Consortium of Universities for Global Health and has chaired several of its committees. He also serves on the Global Health Board Committee of the Foundation for Advancement of International Medical Education and Research and the African Representative for the Educational Commission of Foreign Medical Graduates. He is deeply committed to global medical education and works intensively with new medical schools in Africa. He founded and is an executive board member of the Consortium of New Sub-Sahara Africa African Medical Schools, a consortium serving the needs of over 130 medical schools in Africa to promote their education, clinical training programs, and research. Our next panelist is Dr. Peter Singer. Dr. Singer is the Special Advisor to the Director General of WHO. He's also a Professor of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He previously co-founded the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics and Grand Challenges Canada. Next, we have Faith Nawagi. Faith Nawagi is the African representative for the Educational Commission for Foreign Medical Graduates, graduates and its foundation, the Foundation for Advancement of International Medical Education and Research. She leads the implementation of all the organization's programs in Africa. She is a PhD scholar in health profession education from Makerere University. She pursued her master's in international public health, global health, from Euclid University, postgraduate certificate in clinical epidemiology and biostats from the University of California, San Francisco, and bachelor's degree in nursing from Makerere University, Uganda. She has extensive experience in health workforce domains in Africa, international project development and implementation, development of global health training curriculum, short elective curriculum training, teaching global health, health equity, designing, planning, implementing, and evaluating multi-country and multi-site projects. She has received various grants, 
and has been a PI and co-PI on numerous research projects whose outcomes are published in various scientific journals. She has profound experience in developing, managing, and implementing multi-country health and workforce programs in Africa. Welcome, Vic. Our next panelist for today is Dr. David Muganzi. Dr. David is a highly motivated young doctor with a passion for improving healthcare quality in Africa. He holds several leadership positions, including president of the AfriHealth Student Community and chairperson of the Patient-Centered Care Movement Africa, PESIM Afro, a student-led initiative that is advancing patient-centered care across the continent. David has a pro proven track record of success, having grown PESIM Afro to over 1,000 members across six countries and serving as the Vice President of the Federation of African Medical Students Association, FAMSA. He has co-founded initiatives focused on health education, mental health, and climate change, and is a published researcher and recipient of the CAMTEP Acceleration 2022 grant. Through his work, David is creating opportunities for health professional students to develop skills and networks while contributing to the improvement of health on the con in the continent. His current project, which is funded by the CAMTEC grant, focuses on improving malaria diagnosis through data science techniques. David is also highly interested in building health solutions based on data science. He believes that data science can be a powerful tool in addressing the complex health challenges facing the continent. With his expertise in the field, David is working to incorporate data-driven solutions into his current project focused on improving malaria diagnosis, and he's eager to explore other ways in which data science can be used to improve health outcomes in Africa. He strives to ensure that the next generation of health professionals build a world where everyone, especially in Africa, can access quality health care. Welcome, David. Next, we have Omolola Alare. Omo Lola is a public health dentist and junior faculty at Abafemi Awalowo University in Nigeria. She is currently on study leave to pursue a PhD in global health at McMaster's University in Canada. Her research interests are global, oral health, intimate partner violence, and community engaged, engaged research. She brings a unique insight to this discourse as a mature student, wife, and mother undertaking a PhD 20 years after graduating as a dentist. Welcome, Omololo. Our next panelist is Jose Chen. Jose Chen Zhu is a medical resident in public health. He holds a master's degree in medicine and a master's degree in healthcare economics and management from the University of Koto. He is currently pursuing a PhD in global public health in the National School of Public Health, NOAA University of Lisbon. He was a consultant for WHO. He conducts research with the European Burden of Disease Network and works as a policy researcher and advice intern with the OECD. He is also a research fellow in the Barcelona Science and Technology Diplomacy Hub. Welcome, Jose. Our next speaker for today, our next panelist for today is Mr. Samuel Omidoyen. Samuel is enrolled in the MD program at All Saints University School of Medicine, Dominica. He's currently a visiting student at the American University of St. Vincent School of Medicine. At present, Samuel serves as the founder, president of the Young African Leadership Initiative, Caribbean, a nonprofit organization with profile registration in the United Nations CSO database that engages in volunteering service and community youth development, sports, and research work as it relates to trending public health issues. Samuel also enjoys gospel music and coaching football for recreation. Welcome, Samuel. And next we have Vanessa Anand. Vanessa Anand is a fifth year medical student at Stellenbosch University. She is an aspiring global health specialist who is working towards his passion by investing in leadership development and working closely with organizations that seek to transform various aspects of healthcare across the continent of Africa. Vanessa serves as the Southern African Regional Representative of the AfriHealth student community. She is also the chairperson of the Stellenbosch University Tigerberg Student Representative Council and has served in various roles in the Student Representative Council over the years. 
She has served as a Stellenbosch chapter secretary on the International Federation of Medical Student Association and the Standing Committee on Public Health. She has also worked on research projects with the Stellenbosch University Center for the Global Surgery Department and the Patient Center Care Movement, which is a network of healthcare students in Africa working towards the promotion of healthcare delivery. Welcome, Vanessa. Uh, once again, a heartfelt gratitude for all the esteemed panelists for taking out time for joining us today. Uh, for the flow of the panel discussion, we will be reaching out to each esteemed panelist one by one with a variety of questions to get their expert insights. While someone is speaking, the other panelists can also share some extra points or thoughts in the chat box. For starting this panel discussion, the first question is for all the panelists and uh, they can raise their hands using the Zoom feature so that I can call them out for speaking. So the first question to initiate this today's discussion is, what do you think is the topmost barrier and challenge currently for students or early career professionals wanting to become established in the field of global health? What barriers are specific to students from the LMICs? So uh, the panelists who are interested to go at first can raise their hand on Zoom. And I'll be glad to have their inputs. I'll uh, repeat the question uh, once again. That is the topmost barrier and challenges currently for students wanting to get established in the field of global health. So I think Samuel and Vanessa has raised their hands. So Samuel, would you like yeah. to please share your inputs with everyone? Yeah, thank you, sir. Well, first and foremost, I would like to share that global health work requires key personal attributes. That includes humility, cultural sensitivity, openness and flexibility. That's very critical as it relates to global health work. So as to what do I think as the top barrier, you know, challenges currently, you know, affecting student training, in my opinion, I believe there's need for increased interpersonal networks and interprofessional collaboration, both at home and abroad at all stages of global health work and experience. So I believe the lack of or inadequate interpersonal you know, network and interprofessional collaboration, ethical issues and bias are leading, you know, challenges in the field of global health. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel, for your valuable input. Uh, next, we have Vanessa. You can unmute and share your inputs with us. Um, thank you so much for the question. I think um, my answer to this is twofold. So um, on one aspect, there's the challenge um, that comes from a lack of like opportunities in terms of global health education. So as an undergraduate medical student who has like during my training, I developed a passion for global health and social justice. And like now while busy with my undergraduate studies, I've been looking at different opportunities or different courses that I can do. And a lot of the opportunities or courses in terms of global health are often in um they are your um not they aren't often presented lower middle income countries. So most of the time, the training global has to look to the global north in terms of opportunities. So that's the major challenge, number one. And I think another major challenge, which was men uh, mentioned and came across in terms of the survey findings is mentorship. Um, finding someone who is in the global health space, who actually has the time and um, is willing to actually mentor me and be there in terms of guiding me in terms of the things that I'm interested in. Um, so I think mentorship is a major challenge in terms of, um, yeah, actually pursuing a career in global health um, because the field of global health is so broad there's so many aspects to it um there's um health policy there's so many different things um because of how um interdisciplinary global health is so without the um support and direction of mentorship it's been very difficult trying to navigate the space so i think number one in terms of um courses offered and opportunities to further one studies and then secondly mentorship Thank you so much, Vanessa. Indeed, opportunities in global health and mentorship are the, are the barriers which was also reported in the survey, which is faced by multiple students from LMIC. Uh, the next, uh, I have Jose. If you can unmute and share your insights with us. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, as an early career researcher, I've seen that it's quite hard for 
uh, young researchers to get to know uh, what there is because there are so many opportunities out there and you have to really look for them and really um, find them. So uh, sometimes, uh, as someone already said, we need a good mentorship to guide us through uh, all these opportunities and guide us through the right topics for us. And the other issues that I find and that are not particularly only related to me, but also for my peers, is that uh, some of the programs uh, and because uh, the research is a, a point of entry to get into a global health career, uh, is that sometimes these programs can be a bit ex expensive. So it's difficult to find or it's difficult to apply for and there are many requirements. And one of them is also the recognition of former education to proceed to, for example, PhD studies. So uh, uh, this can be a, a big challenge because uh, these um, degrees cannot and might not be recognized in, in the countries you're applying for. Uh, and another thing could be like the study, uh, the study leave that um, some people uh, are able to get, but others can't. So this can also be a, a limitation. Thank you so much, Jose. That was really uh, valuable. Uh, I think next we have Faith. You can unmute and share your insights with us, please. Sure. Uh, thank you, everyone. And yeah, I would like to add my voice about the challenges that low MIC students could face and myself having come and I'm practicing from here in global health and all that. So, yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges is training. Quite frankly, in Africa, I think it's only Stellenbosch that has specifically a master's training or a PhD program in global health. And so I had to train from out of Africa and things like that. But thank God it was online. So I was still able to be in Africa, but study from elsewhere and things like that. But also, it's good for us to appreciate that that discipline mm. of global health is interlinked with many other disciplines. And many times there is actually very close similarity of trend with public health. And we have very strong public health programs here and things like that. But maybe to me, I think maybe these public health programs, uh, especially at the master's level, would have an added track of global health to start it from there before we move into the masters, specifically in global health or a PhD in global health. So the challenge of what is majorly available here in Africa is the masters in public health. And quite frankly, they are very good masters, but the challenge is the lack of uh, a module to be a starting point to have it as a track on the global health program, because we, can't start from some, we have to start from somewhere, but we can't start so big and all that, but we can utilize what is here in Africa to start paving a way forward for that. I think the other part that is an issue is uh, the innovation space in global health. And that is not only a challenge for LMIC and, and all that, it's a challenge everywhere. How do I advance innovation with a global health mindset and things like that? But I also feel like uh, students here find it difficult to appreciate that global health is dynamic. You see, if you have a career in internal medicine, man, it's internal medicine, you have the principles or pediatrics or midwifery and all that. But the concepts of global health are dynamic. And if you are looking at so like health equity for all, for everyone and everything and all that, these things change so students find it difficult to appreciate that actually a global health career is dynamic. It's not like, I'm going to be this, you constantly keep on changing what is being done and your focus as you practice this and things like that. That's what I have to say and over to you. Thank you so much, Faith. I think listening to you, I, I could also relate to a lot of the points you were saying as a student from LMIC myself. Now I move ahead next to Dr. Peter for sharing his expert insights on the question. Thank you very much. I'd like to start by wishing everybody a very happy World Health Day. WHO turns 75 today on April 7th. And you know, when we celebrate uh, World Health Day, we're also celebrating the right to health, which is enshrined in, in WHO's constitution. Um, I want to build on the points that uh, the other panelists have made, and it's uh, wonderful to, to be here. I want to uh, talk a little bit about mentorship. 
You know, it's very hard to answer the question, what do you want to be in 10 years for, I think, a young person? But it's not so hard to answer the question, name three people who are doing what you think you might want to be doing 10 years from now. So my suggestion, practically on mentorship, is identify those three people, wherever they might be in the world, uh, that you think are doing what you want to be doing in 10 years. And then reach out to them, ask them for career advice, and turn them into your mentors if you like them. If they don't respond to you, you don't want them anyway. So it's a very practical strategy. And uh, one of the top three tips that I have for uh, career advice for young and not so young people, which is get the right mentors working for you. The other ones hopefully we'll talk about in the, in the context of this uh, panel. And I'll put a link to, uh, to my blog where they are. Last point I want to make is just that, um, you know, historically, mentorship, I think, has had an anti-equity uh, effect in terms of the old boys club, et cetera, and people promote who they know. It can also be one of the most powerful pro-equity forces. And that's up to us. So if everybody, if every young person who's interested in global health does that little exercise of identifies the top three people uh, that, who are doing what, the, the, what you think you want to be doing in 10 years, and you reach out to them, then that's a type of movement that will create a very, very strong pro-equity uh, pro effect in global health. So um, uh, hopefully I'll come in more with other uh, suggestions. The, the blog is singerp.substack.com and I'll also put it in the chat. Thank you, Pratush. Thank you so much, Dr. Singer, for your wonderful answer and the interesting tips you have given us for finding mentors. I think that's very helpful. And we're definitely going to reach out to your blog to see for more suggestions of our trainee experiences. Uh, thank you once again. Now I move to Dr. Igba for sharing his expertise on the topic. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm a little bit perplexed by the um, avid interest in what is largely a Western construct of global health. Um, we did a survey uh, during the pandemic, which I spoke about a couple of days ago on uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the uh, global health programs globally. And we surveyed about 350 programs globally. We struggled and struggled to find what we call global health programs in low and middle income countries. Only 17% could be located. So there clearly is a disparity in where global health programs are located. But we have to keep in mind, and I've said I grew up in, in Africa and I was born and grew up and spent a lot of my life there and work a lot there. And we know this, you live global health, we, we kind of do global health. And um, I'm always puzzled why there is this huge need to come and do the way we look at global health in the West and put on our lenses and then go back and I don't know perhaps look at it incorrectly or maybe it provides more insights but um, you know I'm in view of the whole decolonization movement as well global health has a, a very um, western kind of view of looking at it and I'm a little perplexed and wonder how we can <clears throat> reverse that a little bit that we don't feel this need that you have to come to HICs to understand, to do what you're doing in local context. So I think Faith made a point that you have public health in, in, your, pro, in your local context. And I think, I'm not saying don't do it, but I think there should be a very strong push locally to develop your programs, uh, whether it's public or global health to do it locally, you've got everything there. You don't need to come and tell us, come, come and learn from us how to do it in, in your own countries. So I um, would be curious as the day wears on to hear your perspectives on why they cannot be more of a push to learn these skills locally. Obviously there are financial and resource constraints, but I would caution, even if there is a need to come to the high income countries, you should push and make people in high income countries aware of your local context rather than assuming that we know how to do it. So anyway, that's my comment about uh, global health, you know, as, uh, as something which, which it's odd that you have to come to high income countries to learn what, what you're living daily. Thanks very much. 
thank you so much, Dr. Ekbam. I think that was really eye opening for us too, because the Western kind of the context which we have been taking that we have to move out to HIC to learn about what we should be focusing and pushing in our own countries and it's available. So that was really an eye opening answer for me. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ekbam. And uh, I think uh, we can move ahead with the next question for which I'll hand over to Elizabeth. Yeah, so the next question actually builds upon um, Quentin, what you were saying. Um, our question for the panelists are, so many students from the Global South seek global health training and global health programs in the Global North. So why do you think students seek, or what do you think students seek in global health programs? Um, how can global health organizations or university programs in the Global South create a better environment for students and trainees to have a global health career? Well, I, I can follow up quickly if you if you want. Sing, I, I maybe went into that question myself, um, and I, I I shouldn't be answering it. Those who come and say what they're seeking is is should should answer it. But I, I mean, I guess at some level, you know, the the teaching uh, and resources are kind of there. Um, there's maybe a longer tradition of experience and newer sciences like implementation science and. <clears throat> some of these disciplines may not be as fully developed. So I'm not completely dismissing <clears throat> that there are things that can be learned in high income countries. But um, that, that I, I'm a little worried that people come and feel that they, they can, that they only have legitimacy if they get a rubber stamp from a, a high income country, that, that that is the career part and that's the rubber stamp to a proper career in global health. I wish we could move beyond that and that a rubber stamp from Makerere or Stellenbosch or even a other university will soon be equally, if not more legitimate. That, that would be my hope. Thank you for that. Omo Lola? Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon from my end, everyone. Yeah, so that that from Dr. Ekburn has been is really thought um, provoking. So I will speak um, like personally from like from a personal experience of um, wanting to go into global health, having studied um, so up to my first degree in Nigeria, um, and then deciding that I wanted to pursue something in global health, and I had a deep desire to do this like i wanted to do a master's in international public health and i wanted this out of nigeria like somewhere in a high income country i ended up going to australia the university of sydney in australia and why did i so i waited i think i must have waited um 10 years almost just because i didn't want to do this in nigeria so the question is why 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 wouldn't i do um, a master's in public health in Nigeria, why would I have this deep desire? So two things, um, maybe at the surface of it, the idea that is global, I wanted something like a different perspective from what I'd had for, um, I would say the first 22 years of my life. So I wanted a different exposure. But another thing was um, just resources, just plain access to resources. And I'll explain what I mean by this. Um, so the educational system, I believe in Nigeria is fantastic. I'm a product of it. And everywhere I've gone, I believe that I've been um, a good test testament of, of our fantastic educational system. But the truth of the matter is my teachers, all of my teachers from nursery school to university, they taught with with their sweat and their blood like there wasn't that support system for them so a lot of the teaching um on the teachers parts and on the learners part was just great like there's no electricity i have to study for this exam and i'm going to do it and i got to sydney and um, there were two things that struck me i was like a child in a candy store the library resources were amazing, much better than even many other um, institutions in the North that I've been to. 
like it was a pride with the library that there wasn't any article or book or anything that I wanted that I couldn't get access to it. And you have to understand from my perspective of someone reading an abstract on PubMed, wanting this article and then being asked to pay $30 or $50. And that would just be like, I'll just, it'll just be the abstract, whatever I could get from the abstract. That was it. And then I got to this system where the library was designed for learning. Like it was, what is that book? What is that article? We'll get it for you. And 24 hours, 48 hours. So that was outstanding. Then at that time also, I had um, a mobility issue. So I had a temporary mobility issue. I had fractured my ankle, so I couldn't move around. So I got to this university as a student on crutches. And one of the things that happened, like my first week I was there was, I was assigned to a counselor. So what were my needs? My needs were identified. Okay, no classes in a building without elevators, no needing to climb um, steps to do anything. I had a room on campus where I could drop my bag and books. I had um, like a car at my disposal, like a university vehicle at my disposal. Like I would call and say, hi, it's on my line. I need to get from A to B and someone would come pick me up. I'm telling you that this was, it wasn't heaven, but I felt like this is heaven. So I think such factors are, they're strong pools, like they're strong attractions. We have excellent programs. I will testify to that any day, but the support system is not there. And then when you, I remember somebody asking me what my experience was like, and I was like, you can't fail. How can you fail? There's no way to fail. Like everyone, everything is designed to get you to pass. Whereas in Nigeria, I felt like the system was looking for me to fail in quotes. I had to prove myself to pass. But this system was such that it wasn't about teachers, like it was just the system. So I think those are things that are really strong pools that um, until and we're LMICs, part we're LMICs because of this resource context. Like that's part of what makes us LMICs. So it's not because we feel that we don't have the expertise here, but sometimes you want that different perspective. And sometimes you just want a taste of heaven. I'll put that in quotes. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that, Molola. So Faith and then Dr. Singer. All right. Um, thank you so much for the question. And uh, it's really much, what do students from the Global South seek in global health programs in the North and how can low income, you know? Well, in terms of training, I would like to point out that uh, I think in Africa, there is, sometimes when you actually participate in these global health training programs, it's only that in the North, they are pretty much labeled a master's in global health you know, a PhD in global health and things like that. But sometimes the skills that you actually get out of these trainings and things like that are pretty much similar to some of the programs actually happening back home, uh, let's say the masters in public health and things like that, or international health and things like that. So I think that becomes a learning point and step for us here in Africa to See, how do we label our programs to also be able to have students gain confidence that actually these programs can give me this? Because I believe we have so many programs here in Africa that can actually do that. Then why do they seek the Global North? I think for the main reason I say because they are labeled masters in global health and someone wants to do a master's in global health so and things like that. But yet sometimes the skills you're getting there, you can actually equally get them here and things like that. So, but uh, putting that to Africa and how can universities, organizations and workplaces create career paths for African students to practice global health. I kind of actually believe African universities have, universities organizations have made a very big step in enabling African students develop a global health career here in Africa. I am one of them. I live in Uganda, I've run a program across Africa in 15, in 15 countries and things like that. 
But I also want to point out that uh, the space for networking is key. And Africa has also made that effort, quite frankly, AfriHealth has gone a very big way in ensuring that we are all working together towards a common goal and contributing to HC, sustainable development goals, but also to global health as an entirety in all. So there are many research centers here in Africa that are actually helping Africans to advance that. Myself, I once worked at the Johns Hopkins Research Collaboration here, and then now I work for ECFMG and FEMA, but I run programs for the organization here. But I also want to point out the fact that global health does not mean you should pack your bags and go to another continent. But also, it could mean that because it is an integrated way of working together and mobility is part of global health. But I also want to appreciate that there is regional global health, contextualizing global health within the region, and also using that as an opportunity to advance global health. Why do I say so? We run an Africa regional mobility program for the past eight years in partnership with AfriHealth. And we measured if students doing regional mobility within Africa are appreciating the same global health skills students who are going to the North are getting. The paper is now published and quite frankly, students were gaining the same skills. And what was different, actually, students who are gaining knowledge that is applicable back home and benchmarking systems that are similar to their home setting. But did that mean that going to the north was not relevant? It was very relevant. Why? It's also good to benchmark goods like systems that are way scaled up and probably gain uh, uh, inspiration to, to, to acquire and move towards, you know, a standard that is better and all that. So what is my point here? People can practice global health from anywhere in the world. It all depends on what priority you want to practice it at. People can move from one country or one continent, but Africa has provided and is still providing and is still making effort to ensure that we are actually appreciating the global health space in Africa. Over to you. I hope I've made a point, but that's my own opinion anyway. Great, great. That is a wonderful point. Thank you. Dr. Singer. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to you and your colleagues for organizing this uh, panel. Um, you know, I wanted to just talk about a few opportunities from WHO for young people because WHO is neither the global south nor the global north. In fact, it's both because it equally represents 194 countries around the world. And it's very, I mean, WHO is all of us and that's something really to reflect upon on its uh, 75th, uh, 75th anniversary. Uh, first opportunity I wanted to highlight is the internship program. You know, when Dr. Tedros got to WHO in 2017 and I had the privilege of going with him, uh, the internship program was unpaid. That represents a fundamental barrier to uh, people in the global south. And uh, so now the internship program is paid and uh, has a stipend, has uh, some living support. So the internship program is one opportunity. And by the way, unpaid internships are the first uh, in a cascade of inequality. And so fixing that, I think, is an extremely important uh, accomplishment. The second one I want to mention is the Young Professionals Program for people a little further. That is specifically a funded program at WHO that is specifically oriented to colleagues from low and lower middle income countries. And the third thing I wanted to mention was the WHO Youth Council, which is uh, a way to engage uh, young people. There are many opportunities, obviously, for young people to get involved in WHO and for trainees to get involved, but I wanted to mention those three. I also just wanted to build on something, if you don't mind, that Faith was saying about, you know, you in the global north, you in the global south. My top career advice to young and not so young people is find a problem and solve it. Find a problem and solve it. And uh, so you're more likely to find a problem that, and solve it that you're familiar with. And so, uh, you know, I think if you think about your career, not as a set of titles, but rather as a set of problems, consecutively more and more important problems that you solve. 
uh, that really puts uh, things into context. And I'll just end with some advice I was given by a mentor of mine, John Evans, who said, you know, it doesn't matter what it says on the outside of your tombstone, by which I think he meant the titles that you hold. What matters is what it says on the inside of your tombstone, namely the problems that you've solved, the contributions that you've made. And I want to just encourage everybody to think about your career as the contributions that you've made and to think about these training opportunities as the channels through which you have the opportunity to find a problem and solve it. So thank you, Elizabeth, and thanks for the opportunity to make those remarks. I put the link to my blog in the chat and, uh, and uh, I expand on some of these ideas there and wish everyone good luck on this World Health Day. Great, thank you so much. We, um, we also have a, a slide with a QR code and link for, um, anyone after this panel session, so. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So the next question, Pradyush, would you? Sure. Thank you, Elizabeth. So I think we'll move ahead the panel with the next question, which is how do we make systemic changes in global health so that more trainees from LMICs who want to work in global health are able to? So focusing more on the changes which we can make in global health so that the programs and everything becomes more accessible and how can trainees from LMICs who want to work in global health are able to. Uh, the panelists can raise their hands who want to share their inputs on this question. Sure. Uh, over to you, okay. Omolala. Please share your input with us. Okay. So I think um, Dr. Ekbam sort of like we, I think the first thing is like a change in, in our perspective, like not being fixated on, <laughs> on going to um, a high income country. I think that would be one. But I also think that uh, like on the flip side, People from high income countries find it easier to come to LMICs than people from LMICs to go to high income countries. That's that's a perception I have. It may be wrong. So, but I think the first thing is maybe sort of just a shift in a paradigm, like a paradigm shift in how we think about these issues. So maybe um, so things that I'm learning, like just being on this panel, is not being so fixated on going out of um, of LMIC to a high income country and um, having a mindset of um, solving problems that are here. Um, but in, in doing that as well, we have to recognize that um, there, there, these inequities are structural ones that, um, that are sort of, that favor people from HICs working in global health, like in having that global, that global touch to it. For instance, at my university, McMaster, where I'm doing my PhD now, um, one of the things that they have to do is as a global health problem, they need to have a partnership in an LMIC country. So it's not a global health program if it's just a Canadian program. So I think those are some of um, the things that are helping. So like we have they have partnerships with South Sudan and um, India and somewhere in, in um, South America. So I think those are some of, so when um, universities start to realize that for, for you to be a global health program, it's not enough that it's a US program or a Nigerian program. It has to be global. Like there has to be some element of exchange and collaboration, I think, um, that will make it um, easier to work in that space. Thank you. Thank you so much, Amalala, for the wonderful insight about collaborations and exchanges between the Global North and South. Uh, next, I think I'll move to Vanessa to please share your valuable insights. Um, thank you so much. I think I'm gonna, um, yeah, I just firstly wanna say, um, I'll just echo what Omalola said in terms of the whole reframing the perspective of how we look at things. Um, I think coming into this, I 
which is reflecting and um, I think just placing an emphasis on how um, public health isn't divorced from global health. I think often we see them as like very separate things. Um, whereas like, um, like, like Faith mentioned when she was talking as well, like on the African continent, there are a lot of public health training programs that are really good. So I think perhaps in terms of solutions, um, which have already been discussed and raised by other panelists, like um, repackaging what is available on the continent um, in terms of like repackaging and reframing and like, you are reselling the programs that are available on the African continent. So they are more appealing for people that want um, careers in global health. Um, for some reason, doing a master's in global health sounds better than doing a master's in public health if one wants a global um, reach, for example. So repackaging those options or those opportunities. And I think also something that I found quite interesting, just thinking about um, in terms of like training for global health is how much like there's so much, there's more resources allocated to um, getting people from LMICs involved in global health and in terms of like the pool, um, there's more opportunities and more resources invested in, okay, providing students in LMICs with opportunities, scholarships, et cetera, to study in the in higher income countries. And if there could be a shift in terms of investing all those resources in developing the public health, potential global health programs on the African continent that would like radically transform um, output from the continent and also like um, developing those programs. So I think it's, yeah, um, in terms of answering that question, I think more resources should be invested in terms of developing um, global health programs on the African continent. Um, and I think um, our higher, our partners, partners in high income countries can assist in that in terms of partnering other institutions to develop their programs. Um, so there is less of a pool towards um, going to the global health. And I think also, yeah, just an emphasis on reframing and how we look at global health. Um, and seeing that it isn't divorced from public health and there's a, a, a like a clear link um, yeah, between the two. Um, yeah, I think those are the key aspects that I would think in terms of like improving global health training. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for uh, innovative and amazing input. Uh, moving next to Faith. All right, uh, so thank you so much. And uh, to me, I would like to contribute by a common African saying we love to say here that if you want to go fast, mm -hmm, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And I will then point it to Professor Marite from uh, Stellenbosch, a member of Afri Health or it says, but without leaving anyone behind. So what am I trying to point to? I think we need to work together. We are, we all need each other, low income, middle income, whatever it is, we are all part of the world. So if we can foster a, 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 an approach of multilateralism, I think that would be amazing. I also think the Northern partners learn a lot when they come here. And also we learn a lot when we go the other side. So at the end of the day, we also learn a lot when we are within our own countries and even when we move within our own countries or regions and things like that. So what am I trying to say here? <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that if we can have an appreciation that we all need each other, everyone is important. Let's foster multilateralism in what we do, but most importantly with trying to do context mapping on whatever it is that we are doing and all that. And so that will be more practical, that will be more reliable, and that will be more sustainable if we want to really advance something that is a common good for everyone. And to me, I think it's not only low middle and income country trainers or students and all that, everyone in this world, wherever it is that we are all from and everything, we all need how do we practice and become global health practitioners and things like that? If we can have that African proverb say within us, applying multilateralism as uh, SDG 17 mentions, but also with a key mindset of context mapping for sustainability, I think that would be good. And over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Faith. And the, I think we all are gonna take the African saying you have shared with us. If you want to go fast, you have to go alone. And thank you so much for your inputs. Now moving uh, next to Dr. Ipa for sharing his expert insights. Yeah, just, just briefly, um, <clears throat> I want to build, Vanessa started the point that I was going to make, and I think it's an important one. 
and I can bring up an example of that. The point is that <clears throat> just as there's a big movement, and we've had a session a couple of days ago on yesterday, I think, on partnerships and decolonization and moving resources from HICs to LMICs and the funding and the PIs, I think there should be a push, and it should come from the students, to relocate the educational resources to LMICs. And a, one example of that, and I'm not sure how many resources were shifted, but there was, I'm not sure there still is, but there were at one point 20 students from Princeton who joined the master's program in public health at the University of Cape Town, and they spent the whole year there. So the program at Princeton allowed them to, to spend the year there rather than at Princeton. To me, that's the beginnings of, of a, a shift in thinking that a good place to learn public health is in the thick of it, not in the high, high up in the clouds at Princeton. So I'm not sure they contributed resources, but certainly their students came in and paid their fees at the University of Cape Town and contributed and their fees were higher than the local students. So I think you should start shifting and asking uh, education programs to move some of the resources to your local places and encourage this bilateral exchange, and not that LMIC students all have to go over and learn in HIC, and then the HIC students come and do their inadequate short-term experiences in global health, and then go back again. So that would be my contribution, that there, there should be an equal push for the education to be happening within context in the LMICs, not, not only in HICs. Thank you so much, Dr. Iqbal, for your expert insights. And I, I think everyone of you agrees with the, bio, the collaboration and the multilaterality of the experience from students from HIC moving to LMIC or LMIC moving to HIC to have a diverse experience and collaborating internationally. Now over for the next question, over to you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, actually, before we move to the next question, I wanted to reach out to Jose, David, um, and Samuel to see if you all had any comments on um, what are some changes, systematic changes that need to be made. Yeah, uh, has, uh, good afternoon again. So uh, what I think is that, um, as you said before, as I think it was Omolola, she talked about the resources that high-income countries have and that you don't have. And I think one big shift would be that, that for example, journals could give uh, open access uh, in African countries, for example, to journals, for example, for, so that you can have easier access to those resources because it's quite easy for uh, Princeton, for example, or for Harvard to have uh, such access. But for you, I think your universities, I'm not sure uh, because I'm not, I cannot speak for you, but. Uh, I think that, uh, as you said, uh, you felt amazed uh, with uh, the resources that we had in high income countries. So I think one of the biggest shifts would be the resources that uh, these institutions could provide to you. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I just wanted, I wanted to add to the point that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to add to the point that uh, Faith made about, you know, if you want to go, far you go together and if you want to go fast you go alone ultimately we are actually uh all of us but hic lmic you name it we are different parts of a big ship so the objective should be to make sure everything possible to ensure that the water does not get into the ship otherwise everybody will get drawn so different cabin different parts of a huge ship so in another way she said if you want to go far together and if you want to go real fast, um, you go alone, but do not leave no one behind. Yeah, thank you. Great, thank you. And David? Yeah, thank you. I think my sentiments are in the same direction. My comments are really in line with what Dr. Peter said, but more towards the individuals. There is a problem with our structures, the systems and the education structure has some loopholes, but this is not about to change immediately. So there is need for individuals to take it upon themselves, to keep themselves with skills, as it was said, and to find mentors, but most importantly, to find problems to solve. Because 
when there is a, a problem and you have the skills to solve it, opportunities will always open up themselves for, for the students or trainees that are interested in a global health career. I think I'm going to share more on that uh, and my question. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. So um, the next question that we have for our panelists, um, and it, it's pretty broad, pretty general. What does the future of global health look like for students and trainees from LMICs? What should global health look like in the future? Any takers for this question? Uh, pardon, once more. Oh, David, would you like to, to answer this one? Oh, I didn't get the last part of the question, I think. Oh. Yes, so the uh, question is, what does the future of global health look like for students and trainees from LMICs? And what should global health look like in the future? So, David, would you like to, yeah. to take a yeah. look at that? So, based on what is going on right now with the efforts to decolonize global health, with the efforts to create more training spaces for students from low income countries, I should say global health looks to be going in the direction of becoming more equitable because we have people committed to, to this cause, both from the global south, like Afri Health, the University of Global Health in Rwanda, even the, the global health departments like at Stellenbosch, they're working so hard to make this happen, but also there are people from the global north that are working towards making global health equitable. So I am I have very positive thoughts about the future. I think it's going to be an equitable space. It's going to be a space where anyone interested in pursuing a career will probably have less friction compared to the people before us. But hopefully the people after us will have less friction than us. And I think this is what I would love for anyone who has the skills put the interest, the enthusiasm to not be limited by where they come from, their identity or their beliefs, but actually be given a space to execute their talents and make the world a better place. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. Dr. Singer and then Dr. Akman. Well, I just couldn't agree more with what David just said. Uh, fully agree. You know what? What the future looks like now, unfortunately, is that the world is going at less than one quarter the pace needed to reach the health-related sustainable development goals, be that in universal health coverage or healthier populations. And we know from COVID that no country was fully prepared for a pandemic of that scope and scale. So um, at the moment, we've got a bit of a burning platform. Things are not looking great right now in global health, despite you know 75 years of incredible uh, incredible accomplishments. So that's what the future does look like. It's a burning platform. What the future should look like, I think, is exactly what David said and exactly like this panel. What the future should look like is young people finding problems and solving it, because that's the only way to change that slow progress on the sustainable development goals. You know, the sustainable development goals are only as good as the people trying to solve them. And the people try to solve them are you. So the future of global health should look like this panel. And I just want to fully endorse uh, what uh, David said, which is that historically, there's not an even playing field of opportunity. You know, talent is global, opportunity isn't. So what the future should look like is regardless of where you're from, if you're solving problems, you have the same access to resources, to mentorship, to support for solving those problems in global health, uh, completely regardless of where, uh, where, where you live and who you are and, uh, and, uh, and where you're doing that. So just to fully agree with David, again, to wish everyone a very happy uh, World Health Day, because I think that's what it represents. It represents all of you, all of us, 
um, working to make uh, make the world a better place. And also just to, to recognize, I see my friend Keith Martin, who's the executive director of um, CUGH is on here as well. So Elizabeth, alongside recognizing you and your friends wanna wish a very happy World Health Day to Keith. Mm -hmm. And I know that Keith has been very focused at making sure that CUGH reaches young people right around the world and trainees right around the world. And so uh, happy World Health Day to you, Keith, and to everybody here. And, uh, you know, let's embark on that brighter future together. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Dr. Apple. So I, I put a very controversial statement in the chat, um, which I don't believe. <laughs> But it is, I want you to make be aware that there is another view that, that keeps coming up in the background, and that is the decolonization debate. And that global health, we have to think about this. Is it a Western construct or is it something over and beyond that? And I have pondered the statement a lot, and I think it's hopelessly idealistic. And I think there will always be problems to solve. And the move should be, as other speakers have said, towards equity. And it would be wonderful if we had a world without problems where we, we didn't need to think about these things. That said, I think we should still move aggressively towards, as, as far as possible, decolonization and uh, equity and things like that. But um, the haunting elephant in the room is still, you know, to what extent is global health a Western construct? And or not. And I think sometimes I think the word to add, to add at the end of it is global health equity, like the University of Global Health Equity has probably got that right. But anyway, just to throw out some food for thought there. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Faith and then Dr. Martin. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. And I just, I was on a, first of all, thank you very much, everybody, for for being on uh, this really important uh, session. And at the end of it, if you can aggravate, aggregate, sorry, aggregate uh, some of the recommendations, we'd be happy to share them around the world. And I, uh, as uh, Dr. Singer and other speakers have mentioned, this is just, and it's great to see you, Peter. Thank you very much for joining this, uh, this group and happy World Health Day to you too. Um, uh, again, please look at Dr. Singer's blog. It's it's very it's superb, and he was also on one of the leader interviews we did this year. So please take a look at that. And uh, Dr. Singer is able to interrogate many other issues. I was just on a. We have other sessions going on right now, and and um, we're holding one on blindness, which is a major unrecognized, uh, underrecognized public health challenge with a lot of very low hanging fruit and simple solutions to address. And it's really, when you look at it, the equity issues are just pretty yawning. So, and, and unbelievable. Um, and the solutions to address them are fairly easy, um, but it requires a lot of advocacy. So from our perspective at CUGH, a couple of things just to draw attention to if I could, and to bring you up to date on. Number one, with the Afro Health leadership, we're really committed to working with the leadership of Afro Health, as all of you know, in capacity building. And uh, Dr. Elsie Kaguli Malawadi, the president, uh, shared with us the number one priority for Afro Health, which is capacity building and training. And as I mentioned in the talk, we created a new capacity building site, uh, cughcapacitybuilding.org. Please take a look at that and please share it widely. You are our ambassadors. And, um, and uh, are, are so powerful in being able to drive uh, attention to some of the challenges that, that uh, exist in capacity building. So if you could share that site widely, we'd be extremely grateful. Um, and um, finally, um, as Dr. Kuguli Malawadi mentioned, and uh, Mrs. Georgina Yabo, who's the executive director of AfroHealth, who's on this uh, session, um, please note that, uh, that uh, we are committed to working with AfroHealth to strengthen South-South collaboration and the sharing of programs and interventions uh, and curricula and trainers that are language appropriate, culturally appropriate, and uh, are, I submit, perhaps a whole lot more effective than having somebody from a high-income country just scoot in for a short period of time. So um, please uh, see us at CUGH and all of our TAC members know as an avenue to being able to work with you as you guide us, TAC members, uh, sorry, Afro Health members, in what we can do to strengthen South-South collaboration, 
an advocate for the resources that AfroHealth members need to be able to strengthen your programs, strengthen your trainers, remove obstacles to participation in global health, and enable you as students to have the programs, the training, and the career that you wanted to have, that you want to have, and address that big problem that uh, Dr. Singer mentioned. So um, uh, thanks everybody, and, and Elizabeth, back to you, and just thank much gratitude to all of you for uh, participating on this. We hope to see you next week at our main conference, uh, in-person conference in Washington. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth, for your leadership uh, in what you've done. You've been an amazing leader for the TAC, uh, outstanding. And, and um, we really thank you and welcome Matthew and, uh, and um, Dr. Schmel for also, Dr. Kimberly, Dr. Schmel for, for taking on the, the reins after this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keith. Um, Faith. Yeah, thank you. So I think I just have three points. And in addition to what the rest of the team members have mentioned, equity is key, really. We need to understand belonging, this means five bias, and you know, appreciate how to work together and all that. To me, I think that is key. However, I think in the future, as in as we are part of creating the future, we need to see that we support innovation to start and be developed in any part of this world. I think that would be very great. And uh, there are efforts to do that, but that can't be achieved alone. So that's why I always emphasize that the future should be interprofessional in nature, allowing uh, collaboration among different kinds of health workers in the field of global health, but also multilateral in terms of collaboration, allowing North, South, South to South, all types of partnerships towards a common goal on a particular problem that we are all trying to, to address and things like that. And uh, the future should allow ways to have that platform where we can all be connect connected digitally in uh, line to how do we have a common knowledge sharing space? I think there is a CUGH, uh, knowledge sharing database, I think that's a good move. AfriHealth is trying to bring all of us in Africa together to have one unified place and that's good. And I see a future that still promotes that spirit of multilateral, multilateralism, spirit of interprofessionalism, of health equity, but without leaving anyone behind. So over to you here. Great, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, so in the interest of, of time, I wanted to open up the, the floor to any questions from the audience for our panelists. Any questions or comments? Oh, Ashley. Hi. Um... If I, I if anybody else has a question, I'm I'm happy to wait. Um, but I I really appreciate all of the panelists. I think that it was such um, such amazing just personal stories as well as insights. I I feel like I'm gonna chew on this for a while. Um, I um, I just had kind of a question as I've just been personally trying to synthesize a lot of what was shared um, and just. Uh, kind of a common theme of um, needing to reallocate resources um, and uh, specifically financial resources and scholarships, you know, especially scholarships in the, um, you know, HMICs to be not so much pulling people here, but to, to help, um, help in other countries, um, you know, and, and, and to be able to, um, yeah, to, to better allocate those resources. And um, just coming from maybe a, a more of a, from the academic side, um, I, I've been understanding that universities kind of function a little bit like businesses. And so I, I was just wondering if anybody had any insights about, um, you know, how to really approach this with universities um, and, um, you know, other, institutions that are kind of controlling these funds um, and 
um, how to, I, as a little PhD student, I feel, you know, kind of overwhelmed of how do I try to help encourage this? Um, and so um, I, I was just wondering if anybody had any thoughts about ways to um, try to encourage, like say my own university um, to not hold on to their own, you know, financial resources, but to use it in a more equitable way. Do we have any of the panelists who'd like to speak? Dr. Akba? Yeah, I mean, I think I've been raising this point. Um, I think you're making a really good point, and it's come up in numerous other contexts in the decolonization debate um, that, you know, whenever we've tried to do stuff like shifting funding or opening up libraries within universities to LMICs, you run into roadblocks often with the people controlling the financial resources and the legal departments raise all sorts of issues like their, their legal kind of barriers to doing this. And, you know, it's possible that universities like Harvard and Princeton, which have done these moves to UGHE and University of Cape Town are so well endowed and resourced, they have the financial clout to do it. So that may be one way in which it's done. I think, you know, I think it has to come from a grassroots request. The students have to start requesting it again and again and again. Persistence and create a culture and a sort of a semi-protest environment within the university that that is what you want. And in particular, and this is maybe a reason it works in private, well-endowed universities, at least in the United States, where students are customers, you are customers, you're paying high fees, you can begin demanding this. And once it becomes, you know, one university does it, I think the others will start gradually following it. Um, so I would start thinking, let it come from the students, make it a demand, regard yourselves as a customer, at least in the United States, uh, and request it and write articles to the university newspapers, hold meetings to discuss it, write editorials in newspapers. And that is the way, in quotation marks, you shame the leadership into doing it. Um, that is how many movements got moving. The TAC movement for HIV treatment in South Africa was shamed the companies into changing their, their attitudes. And I think it needs to be done. It's all in the interests of your learning. It's your learning and the learning of students from LMICs bilaterally. And it's, and it's in the interest of equity. That, that's one suggestion I would have. Any other panelists would like to you want to chip in too? Yes. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I have uh, something to share, and it's mostly to us, the the students or the trainees. The survey results showed that the biggest problem for LMIC students is resources, money. To make it simply as that, and we know that people divert their money or decide where to put their money based on interests. And maybe the people who have the money do not have our interests on, on top of their priority list. And maybe this is not going to change in the immediate future. But I'm speaking to the students on this platform. In the not so far future, you're going to be in positions where you can allocate resources. I'm sure that all the students on this platform are going to commit to grow their careers to positions where they can make some good money. Currently, the scholarships that are available, as we saw from the results, one of the things that drives global health careers are scholarships. Most of these scholarships are coming from the global north. And it's not that there are no people from the global south to offer money for such scholarships. As we can see during political campaigns, there are generous donations to different causes. So I am putting it up as a challenge that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, let the people on this platform, when, they are, when we are in those positions where we have some resources, where we are in positions to influence the flow of resources, let us influence them towards things like scholarships. Let us influence them towards funding of research on the continent. Studies have showed that 
a large percentage of the research is foreign funded. So we need to find ways of making our priority lists take up the monies that we can influence. That is one of the things. And then the other point, lastly, is while the status quo may, may change slowly, or as Dr. Peter has put it, it is changing at a very slow pace. The thing that we can do first is to change ourselves as individuals. Yesterday, but when I shared what the role of health professional students in advancing global health in their institutions, and it can be summarized into imagine and create. But I, I'm now adding the point of find problems. Dr. Peter has told us to find problems. When we find them, I, be, I encourage that we should imagine what could be done differently. We should imagine solutions. We should imagine initiatives like this discussion. We should imagine what can be said, what can be done, and then go out there and create that imagination and bring them to life. This way, we shall get into the global health space and build great careers. And I believe that in the world right now, it is very, very possible with the internet and the tools that it provides with the accessibility to people across the world. This is so, so much possible. With that, I would like to submit and I hope to continue that discussion and to meet in, in DC when the conference happens. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was an excellent challenge to all of us. Um, let's see, uh, Matthew, and we also had another hand up earlier. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk and I, so many great points. And I completely agree that resources is such a fundamental uh, issue across the board. And I do agree uh, that it needs to be a grassroots. That's uh, definitely going to be uh, an important part of diversifying the resources. And I do also agree with uh, Dr. Martin, uh, who said that uh, the HI, um, that the HIC universities are a business. And I think that that is an important uh, thing to think about when we talk about resources um, because uh, as I said, it's a, it is a major issue across the board, across uh, universities, countries, uh, entities, and so forth. Um, and it seems today that it's an increasingly more selfish world uh, with those who have. Um, and as people are getting more concerned about, uh, or even anxious, if you will, um, about resources, and the distribution of those resources to other entities. And I definitely think that uh, with that grassroots uh, movement that is gonna have to happen for these uh, entities with resources to understand, um, uh, the discourse is gonna have to be consistently and constantly, in my opinion, about showing how these entities, uh, it's in their best interest actually to uh, distribute those resources um, to, to others. Um, because uh, there are signs, and, and there are signs that uh, some of these universities or nations or entities are understanding that uh, important message um, where uh, certain universities like Harvard and uh, MIT are providing free education to those who are below a certain standard. And uh, we definitely see a lot of uh, organizations and countries reaching out and trying to be uh, less selfish with their uh, resources. Um, but um, uh, what I, what I, the important part that I want to uh, recognize is that we all suffer. I think even those who have the resources, we all we all suffer when uh, those resources are distributed amongst few organizations, corporations, countries, entities, whatever. 
um, because we, I think what we see, I think a great example of that might be the 2008 uh, financial crisis, right? Where when the resources are allocated to a small amount, we get an inferior product and we're at greater risk of failure. Um, so I think that that is an important message that needs to be said uh, when we're talking about that grassroots movement. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Georgina. Thank you very much. I dropped off and I'm back. I would like to first appreciate PAC and the Afri Health student community for this good work. I've been following. Yes, I, I'm home, but I'm done well to follow and I've really enjoyed all the presentations, the, the discussions. Uh, what uh, I can deduct from all the discussions is that we need each other because global health has taught us that we need each other. No one can make it alone. If you really want to make the world a better place for all of us, uh, as Faith quoted, no one can really do it alone. So the South needs the North, and the North needs the South. And so we need to really work together. And for us in Africa, uh, an opportunity for students to learn is the student exchange, the interprofessional student exchange program that we've been doing that allows students to learn from other countries and other universities, what is going on, and they can learn lessons from that. I believe that uh, we can also have another uh, area, because from the presentation, the work that was done, uh, I heard that some of the students were saying that they don't have mentors. So I think that uh, one of the things that uh, for us in Afri Health, we can also add is uh, how the students can get mentors also, not only from uh, within the continent, but also from high income countries. Because for me, uh, for my work that I've done uh, in human resource management, one of the things that uh, I got to know is that when we allow our professionals to link up with uh, other developed countries, they also learn certain things that uh, we don't have. And when they come back, it becomes uh, beneficial to us. Uh, Ghana has been able to start a lot of postgraduate programs in medicine and other areas because some people went out to learn and they are back here and we've started the programs and we no longer have to send people to those places. But because of collaborations, they are also able to come here and uh, also learn from us. That's what I'm saying that we need each other. So these are some of the things that we can add and that will be very good for our students. So I'm very happy I was able to join this program though. Today is Good Friday in Ghana and uh, we are enjoying our holiday, but at least it's helped me and I know that working together with Faith, who is coordinating the students in the professional exchange, and David, who is our student community president, and Vanessa also, one of the executives, will be able to improve on what we are doing. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I like that you brought up the idea of learning from each other. And I'm going to quickly step out of my role as moderator and, and mention that, that there is so much that at least those of us at universities um, here, um, I'm in San Diego, can learn and take back. My research is water, sanitation, and hygiene. And there's so much that we can learn from um, other countries from other programs that work and other contexts that we can bring back to here to the US. Because even in the US, we have our, our own issues. I'm from New Mexico originally, and even the Navajo Nation has issues with water, access to water, and um, as well as communities along the US-Mexico border. So to be able to learn from what's working in other countries in low income, middle income countries and be able to take that and apply it um, back to, to the US is important. So the learning goes both ways. Um, so I love that you said that. Thank you. Okay, back to my moderator uh, role, Malad. 
Uh, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, I want to first say thanks to all the panelists. Uh, there was a question in the chat. I just like to briefly answer. Um, as a student in global health and as a TAC uh, student member, um, uh, I've learned uh, I've learned through the hard way actually to address problems in the world uh, through innovation, um, entrepreneurial entrepreneurial skills, and um, uh, and health research. Um, I feel I feel about um, that that spending on my education goals right now uh, would benefit me in the in the long run and uh, things like learning about critical thinking skills uh, knowledge sharing and uh, including being like uh, a member here at the TAC uh, it's all these benefits that global health in the global health field uh, provides Thank you. Great. Thank you for that, Milan. Um, I, were there any other questions? Um, I know there was a question in the chat about how to, how to come to terms with a dual identity. So being an, a student in a high income country, originally from a low income country. And, and how to um, navigate that. Does any of the panelists want to speak to that? So what recommendations do you have for those that identify from a LMIC but grew up in a high income country? It's challenging at times when you have a double identity and are interested in doing global health work in the continent. Is there anyone that wants to speak to that? Omolola. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I'd like to try. Um, so I'd, um, I guess it will be about um, not seeing global health as something that you do in and LMIC, you can do global health anywhere in the world. And where you are is the place to start, like where you are right now is the place to start. So I think um, we've heard this um, about looking at it from the perspective of solving a problem. And um, yeah, so there will always be challenges, there will always be issues, but I think just getting started that this is where I am, this is a problem that I identify and I'm going to start from here. Um, otherwise, um, you keep waiting maybe to be, maybe the issue is being accepted um, by LMICs as one of theirs and but being perceived to be HIC, HIC. But the thing is wherever you are, you are someplace, um, there are problems around you. I would say just start there. I guess um, that would be my small contribution. Great, thank you. Vanessa, you want to build off of that as well? Um, thank you. Um, I just want to expand on what I sort of tried to type up in the chat. It was quite difficult to try to keep track. Um, but I think um, I just want to say, um, yeah, I think today, today's session like really showed that um, in terms of solving issues that are happening on the continent, um, yeah, they, they are collaborative, collaborators. Yes, they are people who are on the continent, from the continent. But I think the main point that I want to make is being from or growing up in a high income country or being from a high income country doesn't disqualify one from contributing to what's happening on the continent of Africa. So I think that's just something I want to um, emphasize that um, where you come from doesn't disqualify you from working in any sector. You can like being from an LMIC doesn't disqualify you from working in HIC, for example. So I just want to emphasize that point. But I think in terms of... Um, yeah, anybody who wants to get involved in the, on the continent of Africa or initiatives, I think something that I really want to encourage um, is getting involved in, in what's happening on the ground. Um, I think, um, especially if, from, if you are someone who isn't necessarily from a particular context, 
um, that would apply to anyone, no matter where, like if you're going from an LMIC to HIC, et cetera. I think, um, you're just being familiar with what's actually happening on the ground and immersing oneself in the context of what's happening, what are different organizations um, doing, what are, the, what are the needs of the people, um, how are those needs being solved so that one doesn't come in with their own perspective of how things should look like. Um, and you're just contributing to what is being done um, earnestly and sincerely and you're just you are pouring one's passion into that. Um, yeah, so I just want to emphasize where you're from doesn't disqualify you, doesn't restrict you to a particular area um, in terms of work, but I also the importance of actually working from the grassroots and working with the local people and working with those who actually know the context and who are working on those issues. So one doesn't come into a particular context with their own perceived notions of how things should be done. Yeah. Hey, thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, so uh, we want to thank the panelists for taking time to, to speak with us, to be part of this discussion. Um, we value your thoughts, experiences, opinions on this topic and cannot thank you enough for, for spending the, the, the time with us, the morning, the afternoon, whatever time it is, wherever you are. Um, so we have one slide to share. Could you share? Awesome, thank you. Um, so for those of you, um, if you weren't able to get in the chat, here is a, a link to Dr. Singer's blog. So you can either scan the QR code or I put a link to the blog right there for you all. Um, and on that note, are there any closing comments from our panelists? Any last words of uh, wisdom or any messages to leave us with? And feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Hello? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Samuel. Closing. In closing, I just want to share that uh, we should, for students in LMIC with the interest to, you know, have a career in global health, should still stay motivated, should stay, stay interested. Because personally, my motiva motivation is something that, you know, is unstable. You could be motivated today, but when the challenges is uh, mounting and you get overwhelmed, you might eventually lose uh, interest. So in closing, personally for me, I maintain this uh, notion that motivation should be a form of constant reminder and recognition of our common humanity that we all share as human, whether you're in the global north or global south our shared destiny, as well as the continued understanding of the interconnected nature of the determinant of health. So that's just my closing remark on that. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Samuel. Any closing remarks, Dr. Singer? Thank you very much. Happy World Health Day. And I hope everyone has a great 75th anniversary year. Uh, with WHO. And thank you, Elizabeth, for your leadership and to your colleagues. Okay, thank you. And uh, Dr. Atma. Yeah, hi. Thank you. I'm glad you organized the session. I do think uh, I'd like students to understand you have more power than you think you have. And um, I, I really would encourage you on both sides to to put forward these notions of equity. The future's in your hands. Um, you understand it better and you need to organize and push for the kinds of change you want, a better world. And uh, don't disempower yourselves, empower yourselves towards uh, moves in this direction. Okay, thank you. So we are not done yet. Um, oh, we're done with the panel panel part but uh for those in the audience members we are not done yet with this session um we'll move into breakout rooms and i'll leave produce to to take that one away oh thank you so much elizabeth thanking all of you once again for your esteemed presence today for the panel discussion
Now we shall be moving to breakout rooms for small group discussion and much more interaction. And it would be a chance for all of you to share your own experiences, thoughts and ideas for solutions to the problems we've discussed in the panel. In the breakout rooms, these are a couple of questions which we would want you all to discuss. What of the first question being, what have been your experiences in trying to get started with a career in global health? Second question being, what are some barriers or challenges that you've either experienced or have seen others struggle with? And what are the solutions to fix these challenges and barriers? Uh, we will be assigning everyone to a breakout room shortly. And we thank you for your patience as we transition to the breakout rooms. You can wait just a couple of minutes and you all will be shifted to different breakout rooms. Thank you so much, everyone. Hey, thank you. Um, so I have created breakout rooms. Um, and I think they should, it should pop up um, for you to join. So please click and join. Let me know if there's any problems. Are people able to join? Um, uh, Georgina, do you have a room assigned to you? And Vanessa? Jacqueline, do you have a room assigned? All right, so I think this is everyone. Produce, if you want to join a room, you're more than welcome to. Let's see, one of them has five and five. So you, let me find you and I can send you to one of the rooms that has five. Sure. It's a little more complicated. So, four. Okay. Did I send I, you the one? <laughs> yeah, I think I just entered the room and I just returned to the main session automatically. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, let me let me try that again. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, it's a little more complicated than I thought. <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, does all the room have a, a moderator note taker? No. I I think so. Let's see. Room Good. Six. I'm going to put you in room one. Sure. It should work now. Hey, Vanessa. Um, hello, Elizabeth. I just wanted to let you know that I'm on two devices just to make sure in case one of them drops out. So you tried allocating me to two different rooms because I think I joined with both my devices. So do you want me in room one or room two? I just want to confirm because Let's yeah. see. Room one, um, Ashley, Pratesh, Matthew, and myself are there. And I don't know if you wanted me to join breakout room two instead. Maybe do two, because you can help. You and Samuel can help. And Malad. Okay. Malad. 
Thank okay. you. We'll do so.
Hi. Hello. Hi, peace. Hi, um, so I'm trying to join through my phone. Is it possible for you guys to add me to group two? Because I need to like move out from where I am and I can't like be on my laptop. I don't know how to join on my phone. Do you get? I'm gonna try, hold on. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay, you switched, right? Um, yeah, I'm in room two, not not three. <laughs> no, no, no. You are in room two. So where where do you want to go? To room two still, but I can't. I can't get into room two on my phone. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Does that work? Uh, I just added it. Yeah. yeah.
All right, we'll just give people a little more time to come back. All right, we are still waiting for some people to come back from the breakout rooms. All right, I think that is everyone. I hope everyone had a um, really great discussion with <laughs> Yes, yes we very great. Yeah. Very great. Yeah, we did. <laughs> um, we did. <laughs> um, so I now I wanna I want us to to share what went on within the small smaller groups, and we have this really awesome resource. I'm gonna put it in the chat. It's a link to something called Padlet. Um, I don't know if anyone has used it before, but um, it's a really great teaching tool for, for those who, who teach. Um, so go ahead and click on the link that I, that I put in the chat box, and it is going to take you to a page that looks like this. Um, so Padlet is like a giant sticky board where you can post anything you want um, by clicking on the little uh, pencil icon and then typing in something here and then you hit publish. So in order to share the, the, conver the different conversations that went on, um, I'd like each of you to post uh, what are some of the solutions and strategies that were discussed? And also, if anyone wants to, to talk as well, um, bring up what, what was discussed. Um, hello, can you hear me, Elizabeth? Yes, I can. Right, for group two, uh, Melad is described the note taker. So is it supposed to uh, post everything on the link that you shared? Yeah, if we, if we could both post, if we could post okay. what we discussed on the Padlet, as well as talk about it here. Okay, so it will, it will be the face for group two. So it will be sharing, you know, talking about it. And of course, it will also post. And uh, and group two, we were blessed to have the presence of Dr. Ekbam. We had a rich, you know, session. Beautiful, beautiful session. Yeah. So tell tell us more about what what you all discussed. Did you talk about solutions and strategies? <laughs> yeah, we we had the consensus that uh, Melad would you know do that. Is M Melad are you there? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, um, so Melabe do that. Thank you, Samuel. In group two, uh, we asked uh, four questions. Um, the first question, challenges in careers. Uh, uh, the participants uh, stated that uh, due to lack of placements in global health, um, they will keep trying to achieve opportunities and uh, they will continue um, uh, achieving opportunities by career development and uh, coordinating uh, in the public health uh, sector, and as well as benefiting from uh, scholarship uh, opportunities. And uh, And what are some barriers? Uh, yeah. Barriers are lack of financial resources, uh, like uh, some conferences also have like strict grant eligibilities. Um, and finally, 
uh, volunteer experience, uh, building uh, knowledge and contributing uh, will help improve the uh, the career uh, potential for uh, the students. Thank you. Thank you, Milan. That was great. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I'm... All right. So um, that was well said by uh, Milan. Absolutely. So in the aspect of lack of uh, experience, right? I remember vividly uh, Professor Egbam, he noted that it's a catch-22. You are not you know, accepted because you don't have the years of experience. But at the same time, you wouldn't have the years of experience if you are not accepted to do it. So it's like a back and forth uh, dynamic. So, um, and that is very, very important. And I also remember uh, Lillian noted the ambiguity as it, of uh, global health concepts, you know, definition terms, you know, and its application that it's a, uh, she, she shared her personal experience. It's so ambiguous and uh, yeah, those are, you know, practical barriers, you know, that are realities, you know, challenges that are realities as to um, LMIC student uh, training. So um, now part of the solutions that uh, Dr. Egbam recommended is started off with building reputation. We have to start off, you know, building our reputation with the basics. I remember uh, Melad sharing that he, he starts with his schoolwork and, you know, writing and, uh, you know, research engagement, volunteering. What all these do, they form the building blocks. They form the building blocks for you to now get the, you know, the global scale of uh, interprofessional collaboration or networking and all of that. And our piece also stated that uh, it's very important to stay positive while we strive to be progressive because we could be discouraged, we could be you know, frustrated because of the non-availability of placement or scholarship or funding. While we stay progressive and all of that, we should still remain positive and all. So these are one of the uh, mentioned uh, barriers and of course the uh, corresponding solution and strategies to them. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Same positive, um, trying to find the situation. Uh -huh. what, um, what, what did the other groups talk about or think about? Now, we had a, a wonderful discussion uh, in our group. Uh, we, I think we tackled some of them you know, very fundamental problems that that need to be uh, really addressed, and that one of them is being defining global health in and of itself. Right? How can we really work on global health, improve global health, if we don't have a shared understanding of what we talk about when we say global health? Um, and we also talked about getting involved locally. How do we get involved? That getting involved locally is in of itself, a global experience, right? And so um, understanding that importance of making sure that our local community is improving in the global health issues that, that we um, see that it needs. And uh, another important um, issue that we, we looked at or uh, was, uh, you know, just just getting. How do we get involved? So you know, um, so maybe getting involved in student government or a student club, and through that process, uh, we can gain greater access at uh, the issues that are uh, of our community at large, and also to connect with other organizations, universities, clubs, etc that may have a shared interest in the same issue. And that um, one important aspect that we need to always consider is the cultural um, you know, differences between what the organizations or uh, you know, the populations that we're communicating with and how certain cultural um, you know, uh, 
traditions maybe um, can have a huge influence on behavior and therefore have a, an important part of you know solution building. So um, those were a lot of the, uh, we talked about our experiences in those aspects. We have, uh, uh, we had members that are, are trying to get involved in their, um, with their universities, uh, people who have done, um, have done work at their universities um, or uh, even broadly um, through travel. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, a big barrier challenge that a lot of people said uh, was, you know, just knowing how to make that next step to go forward. And, uh, and those solutions are what we talked about. And I, I, I would definitely want to, um, you know, address what Samuel was saying, one, you know, uh, which I thought was a great point, was the experience. How do you get experience? To get involved, yeah, there, in a job <laughs> that requires. Yeah Matthew, <laughs> yeah, Matthew, thank you for bringing that up again. Yeah, it, so um, <laughs> it is the age-old question, right? It is definitely <laughs> something that is so frustrating. Uh, you know, you yeah. require two years' experience to get involved in this thing. Well, how do I get two years' experience when I if I'm not allowed to do it? <laughs> right, and I, you know, one thing that I want to kind of reassure everyone with that is that typically speaking, most people are way more qualified for the jobs that they're applying for than they realize. And that there are so many um, aspects of your education or other jobs that you may have had that you can use as experience. So you know, if you've had an education in a particular field, for example, if you got an undergraduate degree in a particular field, or even an associate's degree, you automatically have two or four years experience in that field, right? So those are things that you can use um, to give yourself a, a sense of, uh, you know, qualification, for the jobs that you might be interested in doing. And you can get that on your own as well. You can, you know, uh, experience does not have to be with a job or with a school. It can be uh, personal as well. So if you have a particular interest in something, then you can work on it yourself or get involved locally. And by doing so, whether it's volunteer or paid, you can acquire experience that allows you to get your foot in the door. And typically speaking, that's all you need. Once you get your foot in the door, that's the hardest part. That's the part that requires the most patience, the most dedication is getting your foot in the door. Because once you're in, usually organizations, corporations, they like to promote from within. So just a little food for thought there. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. What um what did anyone else uh discuss or did anyone want to build off of off of the comments from the first group? Omolola and Jose. <clears throat> yeah, okay. Yeah, I could go for a group. So we had a lot of similar issues come up. Um so the idea of needing an internship and even internships requiring experience, which is crazy, like internships as opposed to provide you with experience. And then maybe um, a problem that's maybe peculiar to LMICs where um, jobs are advertised, but the adverts are just formality. Someone's already in that position or someone's been pre-selected um, for that position. So um, that came up. Um, and then the idea of um, you have a problem that you want to work with, that you're interested in, but the funders' priorities are just not, um, like no funder or very few funders are interested in that area. Um, so the idea of needing to work with where the money is rather than maybe what you're primarily interested um, in. 
Um, so we talked about a stack that uh, maybe we could possibly work with universities, like have a voice as TAC members to change funding paradigms so that um, students get a bit of say in, I don't like that, it seems like a long stretch even to me, but that students get a bit of say in, in like how the money is allocated. And then coming to um, international students working in high income countries. So it came up um, the idea of you have all the training, you went through all of these challenges to get the requisite training, but then you can't get a job because the employer has to fund, like they have to do more to employ you than if they were employing a local, like they have to pay for your visa and sponsor lawyers. So that's another barrier that, yes, the training is now there, but overcoming the next barrier of getting a work permit and having an employer willing um, to sponsor that. And then somebody talked about even just finding a supervisor, like you're interested in a research-based program and just um, the the effort it takes to get somebody to agree which is a prerequisite for many programs like you need to have somebody um agree to supervise you before you can even apply to the program but getting um that supervisor is a big one so um well we decided that we have to do a lot of a lot more self advocacy these are all problems, but then we have to do a lot more um, self advocacy. So just um, train ourselves to speak up more to our own issues, and um, and of course visa visa came up <laughs> as well. Like just the difficulty you have the funding, you have the admission, and then you don't get the visa. Like how disheartening that can be. So yeah, that's I think. That's it for my group. But if anyone from my group, if I missed out anything, please um, Jose or yes, yes. No, it was a great summary. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you for that. Um, so um, as we're coming up to to the top of the hour, um, I just wanted to to make a quick request that. If you have any notes, either put them in the Padlet or feel free to, to send them to any to me or to Matthew um, or put them in the chat. Um, and I also wanted to thank you all for attending this session. Um, I know it's we talked a lot about the challenges and the barriers, but I think it should also give you hope for the future that once you identify what are the barriers and challenges, what do we need to change now? What can we what can we pick apart to make that change, to break a system, to change it for the better? So I want to leave you on a hopeful note that things can change when we have a collective voice, when we address the problems um, and we talk about them. So I hope this is not the end of any discussion about everything that we've talked about, I, I hope the conversation and discussion continues um, and the interest in this, this topic and these challenges um, is, is something that you all keep thinking about and you keep thinking about what are solutions and strategies, what can we do to change this? Um, so thank you again for coming. Thank you for those who, who helped to make this a success, the satellite session. Um, thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy the, the rest of the CUGH conference activities for those who are, who are going to be there in person in Washington, D.C. Thank you.